Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of Food and Agricultural Innovation Programs, Jen Smith. Hi, welcome. I'm Jen Smith, uh, and thank you for being part of our fifth summit. As the voice of God said, I'm the director of food and agriculture innovation programs for CREA, Cornell's Center for Regional Economic Advancement. CREA helps startups from any sector scale and grow, and our flagship food and ag startup program is this, the Grow New York Competition. As we begin, we acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands we now stand. This event is produced by Cornell University, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Goyukono. The Onondaga and Goyukono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with an historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Haudenosaunee dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Haudenosaunee people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This is the fifth round of the Grow New York competition. Grow New York harnesses the dynamic food and ag community found throughout central New York, the Finger Lakes, and the Southern Tier, using that power to draw in innovative startups, creating what's been called the Grow New York effect, important economic development outcomes, and increasingly an ability to attract federal attention and support for initiatives that will transition us, the Grow New York region, New York State, the Northeast, towards greater economic expansion and inclusive, prosperous, sustainable, climate-smart agriculture and forestry economy and a resilient and equitable food system. The Grow New York effect is the result of a community working together in pursuit of progress. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the people that make up that community. Our estimable partner group of industry, research, economic development, and startup support leaders throughout upstate New York. Our mentors, who coached the finalists and helped them see the potential in the Grow New York region. Our funders, Empire State Development and the Upstate Revitalization Initiative, Central New York Rising, Finger Lakes Forward, and Southern Tier Soaring. Our Grow New York Summit sponsors, Farm Credit East and Wegmans. And you, you're part of that community. Your support and participation here today helps nurture our regional food and ag ecosystem and gives life to the conversation, voice to the community. Thank you for helping this program meet its potential. So now for some housekeeping. If you're watching us online, you can download a digital version of our program on the live stream page. It has informative content and really stunning photography, so please take a look. Whether you're watching online or in person, throughout the summit, we encourage you to share your thoughts and feedback, questions for the symposium panelists. For those attending in person, you can write your questions on the paper uh, on your tables and drop it off at the question moderator's table. My colleague Lauren's gonna be taking those questions. Online, you can pop your questions into the chat below the live viewing window. Online viewers can turn on closed captioning by clicking the CC in the lower right corner and selecting display captions. And you can engage throughout the event on social media using the hashtag GrowNY. The winners of this year's competition will be announced at the conclusion of the summit on Wednesday. We'll have a reception at 5.30, followed by a brief ceremony with words from elected officials and some of last year's winners. It'll be a brief, elegant affair at the SUNY Broom Culinary Events Center. A short walk or shuttle bus from here at the Holiday Inn. We'll be running that shuttle bus in a loop from 5.15 to about 8.30. Attendance at this event requires additional registration. So if you haven't already added that to your package and you're interested, please stop by the registration desk in the lobby. And in fact, stop by the registration desk in the lobby if you have any questions, anybody you wanna get in touch with, uh, any needs that aren't being met here. Also, during the award ceremony, we'll announce the Wegmans Audience Choice Award. Yet again, Wegmans has generously sponsored this category. You can vote on your favorite startup, and they could win $10,000.
Voting is on grow-ny.com and is open until 4.30 Wednesday afternoon. So what do you have to look forward to today? We have two strong, provocative symposium sessions in addition to the pitch competition and ecosystem expo happening in the main stage lobby and carousel room. Our panels today feature a discussion on climate beneficial technology as an engine for regional economic impact and how digital ag tech might benefit small and mid-sized farms. This year's competition accepted 323 applications from around the globe, which brings us to about 1,500 applications throughout our five years. That's 1,500 startups that have engaged in our region. The 20 finalists this year are increasingly promising, and you'll hear pitches from 10 of them today. Competition's advisor, Brian Bauer, will host the live pitch. Our past winners have created hundreds of new jobs in the Grow New York region and attracted the follow-on of over $100 million in new investor activity, so you'll be watching tomorrow's changemakers today. Here in Binghamton, we have a wonderful lunch planned and coffee breaks. We have regional roaster recess coffee here whipping up espresso drinks to order. We have the Ecosystem Expo featuring dozens of organizations that support startups that are working in food and ag. And we have displays from the 20 finalists and the three winners of this year's Northeastern Dairy Product Innovation Competition. So there's a lot going on in the expo. Also during lunch, you'll have the chance to see New York State's future food and ag leaders during the youth agri-food business pitches on our student stage. Also in Binghamton, we have a number of previous Grow New York winners in the audience. Bio-based building material startup Hempitecture, food waste reducing packaging company SoFresh, AI for the fruit supply chain, Vivid Machines. Look around you, introduce yourself. You're in a community of food and ag innovators and thought leaders. Begin those conversations. You can see a detailed program schedule. All times reflect Eastern. It's a full day, and so let's get started. Please join me in welcoming the host of our symposium, Kathy Young, the Executive Director of the Center of Excellence at Cornell Agritech and a most trusted and valued advisor to Grow New York. Kathy? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to year five of the Grow New York competition. I know everybody is very excited, as am I. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Center of Excellence. So the Center of Excellence for Food and Agriculture at Cornell Agritech shares the Grow New York program's goal of growing an enduring food and agriculture innovation cluster in New York State. And I personally share that goal. Growing up on a dairy and grain farm in Livingston County, New York, serving as a state legislator as chair of the Senate Finance Committee and Agriculture Committee, and also chair of the Rural Resources Commission, I understand all too well the challenges faced by people working in agriculture and food production. And in my role as executive director of the New York State Center of Excellence for Food and Agriculture at Cornell Agritech, take a breath, right? We call it COE for short. I'm honored to work in service of New York's food and farming sector, leveraging Cornell's institutional resources and expertise to cultivate innovation, economic growth, and job creation. The COE helps nurture the agri-food system in New York by pushing entrepreneurs and startups to launch their businesses right here, pulling companies into the state by connecting them with innovation resources and economic development partners, and growing existing food, beverage, and agriculture-related companies from across New York State through business mentoring, technical assistance, and other resources they need not only to succeed, but also to thrive. In this year's symposium, we are exploring how the Grow New York effect has drawn support for the work being done to foster a climate smart bioeconomy in upstate New York and a strong, resilient food system across the Northeast. 
please join me in welcoming Benjamin Holton, the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and Britt Grusman, the Vice President of Climate Smart Agriculture, to talk with me about climate beneficial technology as an engine for regional economic impact. Thank you. Cheers. So welcome. We are thrilled to have you here today. Great Thank to be you here. For having us. Yeah, so let's start by setting the table. Always a good idea, right? So could you please share with us, what is the big picture on the climate challenge? And why don't we start with you, Dean Holton? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> there is a really, really big picture. And I think it's always worth uh, acknowledging that the climate on the planet has changed for 4.5 billion years. <laughs> and uh, yet never before have we, have we seen this level of climate change with a human society that's functioning around the planet where we've adapted all of our systems, our infrastructure, our food system, our business environment to a narrow envelope of conditions which we assumed would be here for a long time. It turns out those conditions are changing incredibly rapidly. And uh, so it's bad. This is uh, a historic year in terms of uh, extreme events, droughts, wildfires, heat waves. Right here in New York, we're seeing it. We're seeing it around the globe. It's getting worse, and it's going to get worse. And I think everyone needs to acknowledge that, that we have to drive adaptive uh, systems forward quickly. And um, we know why it's happening because we're pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at a level that is trapping heat on the planet. It acts like, like a, a giant uh, blanket. Like, you know, if you go camping and you put this uh, beautiful Patagonia, sorry to brand it, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a blanket on or, or, you know, a sleeping bag and, and it starts to warm. Well, that's exactly how these greenhouse gases operate. And then I think the most important point for today's conversation is that we can solve the challenge. And central to the challenge is our food system, globally responsible for about 30% of emissions, and yet can reverse those emissions and drive us to negative emissions more rapidly than any industry on the planet. New York State is in an incredible position, position to lead on those innovations. And uh, so that's, that's what I would consider the big picture. Where do we have to go? We have to focus on the place where adaptation and greenhouse gas reductions meet and map onto what I call resilience. Thank you for that, Dean. How about you, Brett? What do you think? Yeah, what do I add to that? That was great. Um, yes, yeah, so climate change is indeed you know, the, 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 the challenge of our generation now, and unfortunately of our children's generation. So it's always at the forefront of our mind, what, what generation, what are we leaving for the next generations? And as the Dean said, the, the, the evidence is here. I started working in this field about 20 years ago, and at that point, people were still debating a lot of what's and ifs, and um, really the kind of weather and events that we're seeing now, we really can't deny anymore that things are happening and that they are happening a lot faster, unfortunately, than the scientists had expected, right? Scientists have been screaming about it for a while, but even they are surprised about how fast it's happening. So um, we need to do two things. We need to really reduce the greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, and that's in all sectors, and um, that includes the agricultural sector. Until about two, three years ago, people would not talk about climate and agriculture in the same sentence. Um, it was considered too tricky, too politically difficult, um, and all that kind of stuff. And now we're recognizing that every sector has to do its bit because there's just no way we can get to a safe zone without every sector being engaged um, and reducing those greenhouse gas emissions. And some gases we need to get down faster as well. So I need to uh, mention methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas that is not only determining the end um, climate increase that we're going to see, but the rate of warming. So if we want to buy ourselves some time to adapt to what we're already seeing, we need to get down that specific gas. And that's primarily from oil and gas sector, agriculture, livestock, cow burps, rice, um, and waste management. And we need to get those down as soon as possible. Then adaptation, 
Um, that's really where a lot of these technologies can come in as well. It's not just about how do we have technologies that can re reduce the greenhouse gas footprint, it's also about how do, can we help people adapt. Farmers are literally on the forefront of climate change. You know, if you think about one sector that is dependent on temperature and weather, it's farming. Right? And farmers are incredibly adept at changing, and you know, they're very good at adapting to change from day to day, but this is just a change that might be beyond what anybody can really adapt to. We're seeing cows drop dead from sudden increases that they couldn't handle. We're seeing crops being destroyed. Um, we've done some analysis looking at um, some major crops in the US, corn in Iowa, um, wheat in Kansas, soy in Minnesota, strawberries in, in Florida, and all of them, all of them are being affected. Kansas had the worst uh, crop this year that they've ever had. So um, we really need to sort of dig in now, and we need to bring all the ingenuity that we can get to the table, which is why I'm so excited to be here. Well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Dean Holden was talking about the incredible leadership from New York State. But I also am proud to say that we have incredible leadership from Cornell in the research that we're doing. And I know that uh, there's been a lot of research in this area that's been ongoing. And uh, you know, how can we take what we know and apply it? Because that's always the trick, right? Yeah. Well, I think uh, the university is uh, best equipped when it's a vehicle for uh, translation of knowledge. And uh, Cornell is very proud to be the land grant for New York State, which means we have an incredible commitment to the state, uh, to all people in the state, to communities, to our growers, to our producers, uh, to nutrition, to education. And I think of, of all institutions I've ever been a part of, uh, never have I been a part of one that is as focused on that vehicle. Mm -hmm. and whether it's at Agritech, uh, whether it's through Grow New York uh, competition, um, but one of the mo more recent um, advances in the institution has been a grant we received from the National Science Foundation, which we're calling Upstate 2.0. And it's to envision a circular bioeconomy. And this bioeconomy is one that we hope is going to bring about uh, adaptation to our current food system as we're seeing changes happen in such places as California and, as he mentioned, Kansas and elsewhere where there's a lot of drought and heat waves that are happening. New York State has an opportunity to grow our vegetable production. But we, we have an opportunity to do it in a way that puts carbon at the center. Um, so this grant is about zero emission food systems, zero waste uh, opportunities, controlled environment ag, which is one of the fastest sectors in New York State, um, which still needs a lot more innovation. As we've seen, the profit margins on the business have not really revealed themselves. But that's a key principal area. Also. Uh, net zero dairies, and uh, as Britt mentions, methane, and great partnerships with Cornell Atkinson, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and EDF, thinking about how we can uh, envision a future where cows have no emissions and still continue to produce this incredible uh, milk and dairy product to drive innovations forward. Um, and I think, in, I guess the final point is in upstate New York, we are very lucky to have an abundance of water, and yet we are seeing climate change. Uh, in fact, some may like this fact, <laughs> that uh, we're seven degrees warmer Fahrenheit than we were in 1977 in the winter. Um, so you know that might feel good at first, but we know that what's coming with that are pests and pathogens, and that's uh, new extreme conditions we need to deal with. So thinking about this region, uh, whether it's uh, viticulture and enology and wine, or it's net zero dairies where there's so much leadership already happening. This new grant that's going to create a circular bioeconomy is going to say, let's create zero waste food systems, and let's turn waste into opportunities for upscaling and for new, new production that leave no one behind. And that's the final point, is to make sure that this is fully inclusive, that, that we are an inclusive land grant that is reaching out to growers and producers who have been left out of the Industrial Revolution or the Green Revolution technologies. We want them to be a part of this climate revolution, and uh, we're so excited at Cornell to be leading these efforts. So agriculture actually can be part of the solution. 
And I know Britt has written about that um, in the past. And could you expand on that a little bit more about how do we implement these policies and this technology out into the marketplace? Yes, um, well, <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> right now, the policies aren't all that conducive. So the policy system that the US agricultural system is, is in right now is what really a policy system that was designed for the 50s, 60s, the first green revolution. So it was all about yield first, everything else secondary. And that's really what all the US policies are driving right now. Um, we now need to, um, together with the farming community and the sort of technology and everybody who's involved in it, try to kind of shift that paradigm to be really about providing incentives for this greener economy. Um, not just because it's good for the environment, but for, because it's ultimately crucial to the long-term sustainability of agriculture in the US. So it's kind of, you know, yes, as an environmentalist we want it, but also as somebody who cares greatly about the agricultural sector, it's also about the survival of the agricultural sector. So how can we ensure that these, um, that these things happen? One example I think of a lot is this example um, that we worked on with, um, with Cornell Atkinson is, um, right now people are talking about, a lot about cow burps. Um, and about these the methane emissions and I love cheese and I love dairy and I want to be able to eat it without feeling bad about it So what can we do? And so right now there are things that can be done You can feed your cow better you can make sure it has good health all things that mind you already happen in New York and in California The cows here are pretty much machines like they're on super athlete diets um, So their sort of methane per unit of milk is actually quite low if you compare it to the average cow in, let's say, India or China, or et cetera. But still, there are things you could maybe do beyond. And so there are very smart people working on solutions and technologies like something that you can maybe feed the cow. Now, the problem is that these products right now um, have a huge barrier of getting to the market. Um, they need to get through FDA approval. And right now, that is a process that would take about 10 years and many million dollars. And that's a huge bottleneck if you're thinking about you know wanting to invest or wanting to even be in that space as 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 a, as a startup so one of the things that we've been working on is how can we ensure that these kind of approvals are still scientifically robust we want the science to be robust we want it to be safe to consumers safe to the animals but how can we do it so it doesn't take quite as long? So how can we help FDA streamline that process? So these are the kind of things that we've been working on, which some people don't think about. They only think about the science and the technology, and they don't think about the path of commercialization, which is so crucial in the real world. So that's just one example of that. Thank you for that. Would you like to add on to that? Well, I, no, I, I mean, I think that this is exactly right. I think where um, universities come in at our best, we are thinking about a future of possibilities, and we're going to de-risk those innovations by testing and refining and driving the science forward. And then we're going to think about how can this, this possible emergent solution turn into a, a business enterprise, a patent, uh, some sort of intellectual property. But without a policy apparatus, oftentimes the barriers are significant to entry. And so that's where this ecosystem comes together. I mean, this is where Upstate 2.0 is trying to drive the innovation forward. Um, the other thing I would say is that since we're focused on dairy, it's important to understand that New York State dairy has been an incredible leader in sustainability going back to the 1970s. The first anaerobic digesters, which are taking manure and converting it to uh, bioenergy, were uh, derived here right in upstate New York, and yet, it's not happening fast enough. Well, when you go to the dairy farmers and you see how they're using these technologies and they're very dedicated to the environment, you ask them, well, how does this work for your bottom line? And they say, we're losing money every year doing this. And it just strikes me as fundamentally wrong <laughs> that to help the climate and to help the environment and to create circular system, systems, it's going to cost the producer more than if they just went about, about doing kind of business as usual operations. So, we have to unlock that, and the only way that will happen is with great collaborations and policy that understand we have to incentivize, and we have to bring the right tools and technologies to our growers and producers so they can do the awesome work they're doing. Thank you for that. And so there's methane, but there are other things that occur in agriculture that uh, maybe need to be uh, modified somewhat. So I'll give an example. 
controlled environment agriculture. And that's a growing industry. And through Ben's leadership, we have something called moonshots at CALS. And uh, one of the moonshots is CEA. Um, and sometimes with CEA, it works well. And for example, I'll, I'll talk about uh, just briefly in vertical indoor growing, right? And if you grow lettuce, for example, you can grow that much cheaper outdoors without using all the high energy. But there are some really great CEA uh, methods and methodologies and projects that we can do. And could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Well, um, I'm really interested in Britt's perspective on this because <laughs> as a university, again, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> I think hopefully for better, we drive science for without thinking about the economics. Why do we do that? Because we need to peer into that future and bring it to the present. And that's really our fundamental role in society. And that, that requires a lot of uh, resources. But we don't have to worry about, oh, this technology didn't work. And now I can't make a living. And now I go bankrupt. OK, so that, that is something that our growers and producers constantly have to think about. When it comes to controlled environment, I've talked with quite a few CEOs and our own faculty where we have expertise and the state of New York uh, thinking about this innovative new approach to growing food, which will not replace land-based agriculture but could supplement. It's clear that we don't have the right breeding uh, technologies for the kind of crops that can grow indoors. Uh, the energy system and the energy footprint has not been optimized. The supply chains including the metals and everything else that's needed to support the facilities is not there. And then the expertise through our cooperative extension system. So the moonshot that we're focusing on for CEA says we need science to overcome those, what we now recognize are significant barriers to becoming profitable. And uh, we're super excited to do that. Again, we don't know how it will ultimately work, but we're going to tinker on all these issues related to controlled environment because we think it can have a future, especially in uh, resilience to food systems. It can be low greenhouse gas emitting, but it can also be incredibly resilient because it doesn't have to worry about the outside weather conditions. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. I, 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 um, for my sins, I'm an economist. <laughs> um, and so I do think about the economics <laughs> a lot. Um, but um, this, the, the controlled um, environment farming is, is really, it is a potential almost sci-fi kind of future, mm. right? Where you think, well, we can do all of this indoors. We can do all of this while there's a huge storm outside or while there is not enough water outside or while there are pests outside. You know, like when we think about climate impact of ag, we think about the climate stresses that ag's gonna feel and it's things like water shortages or too much, right? Some areas will have not enough, others will be flooded. Um, all these new pests and pathogens that are moving up that you know, farmers didn't know how to deal with that their specific crops have never experienced before. Um, and um, I'm sure there's others that I'm forgetting right now. But <laughs> anyway, so if you, if, theoretically, if you put it in a controlled environment, you can deal with that, right? Perfect. But then you really need to think about what is it that we're going to grow? And so right now, as some examples unfortunately have shown um, nearby where I live, near in Brooklyn, is it's not economical to grow, grow lettuce, right? Lettuce is very cheap to grow on land. Um, so I think we're going to have to really think about in which circumstances does it make sense. And not only gonna, is it going to be what is the, the high value products that you might want to grow, so not lettuce, which is cheap as chips, um, and um, in what locations. Because one of the things I think about as well is um, local food security. I think one of the things we saw with the pandemic was you know, that the supply chain is breaking down. Um, also, food growers around the world not having access to fertilizer, all kinds of really, really difficult things. So um, rather than just think about what's the, the greenhouse gas footprint, um, also how can we produce more food as closer to the people who eat it? So shortening that so transportation line. Um, so those are some of the things we think of. And then in terms of the overall greenhouse gas footprint, one thing I always bring up is do we really need to kind of have an indoor growing system that is really high in energy use if their energy is still created with dirty fuels? Like, how, how can that be? That doesn't make sense. Like, if you have a power plant um, on coal and then you use that 
to grow your vegetables, and obviously the life cycle analysis, the actual greenhouse gas footprint of those vegetables is going to be really high. So just saying, oh, it runs on electricity, therefore it's clean, really depends on how your electricity is, is produced. So it really is very place specific, but I think the kind of the value add of the product as well is, is, is going to be really, really tricky. Well, yeah, so thank you for that. And so, um, you know, I, I do want to mention too that oftentimes now um, people are thinking outside of the box, right? Um, and we're in this climate about climate where okay. we turn on the news. There's a lot of bad news, obviously, right now in the world in general. And sometimes people kind of look at climate almost fatalistically, very much gloom and doom. And how do we infuse that hope and optimism into people so that they understand this may be a challenge, this is a problem, but how do we bring that up and really inspire people to do better, but also inspire people to come up with solutions? How would you do that, Britt? Um, well, I think, I mean, it's easy to go into the glue and doom, but there are so many solutions available. Um, what is often willing is the, the will to change, and that is, both in the political will, uh, corporate will, and so this is obviously as an advocacy organization something that we work on a lot. Um, because there are so many solutions out there that do not need a new sort of high tech solution, um, but you just need to, to implement it. And then there are some things where we really need that innovation. So we have these two buckets that we call, we call it the implementation gap and the, uh, the um, innovation gap. And the implementation gap is like, we, we know you should be covering your manure lagoons, so just do it. Just do it is easy to said if the farmers are losing money, so that means we go to Washington DC and we say, well, you have this new beautiful thing called the Inflation Reduction Act, there's 20 billion dollars in there for the agricultural community, could you please make sure some of that goes to helping farmers with their lagoons? So it's like, you know, looking at those threads, like what is the bottleneck to implementation of things that we know already to do? And then there's this big innovation gap, which obviously I think a lot of people here are trying to solve for. You know, what are the things that we can do better than we're doing now? And it might be things that are, that require AI or like sort of CRISPR technology and like most mind-blowing technology, or it might be simple technology that's really just about providing solutions closer to consumers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think we need all of that. And we really need to sort of see that every sector can contribute to this, right? This year, um, last year was the first year at the, the COP, which is the Conference of the Parties to the U United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. Mouthful, the COP, you've probably heard about it. Um, it's gonna be in Dubai this year. Last year was the first year that food had its own pavilion and was basically on the agenda, which is shocking. It's just shocking to think about, like why was, food not on the agenda, it is now. So I'm very optimistic that that sort of political will and corporate will, we're seeing a lot of corporate step up, is really moving the ball. And then we need to just bring that together with some of these funding streams so that it becomes affordable for farmers to do what they want to do, which is help the climate. Thank you for Great. that. And I'd love to hear your perspective, Dean. Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, you know, I'm yet to see a major challenge solved without a, a decent amount of hope and optimism, number one. I think mm -hmm. there's a good way to fail early, and that's to get very pessimistic mm. and, and recognize, no, we, can't, we just can't do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what brings me a lot of hope are just the history of humanity on planet Earth. You know, like, it, when, when the college was founded um, back in the uh, late 1800s, um, if you look at the United States workforce, it was something like 60% of everybody, so that would be uh, more than half of this room. Your entire job was just to grow food to, to get enough nutrition to support yourself. And today that number is down to only 4%. So 4% of the United States workforce supports the remaining 96%. We need to be very grateful for that. We need to understand that. Um, but that transition happened through an incredible amount of innovation uh, university partnerships, policy uh, innovation, federal government support. And if you think about all that's come out of that, it's incredible. I think with climate, uh, we need to think about it exactly the same way. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be witnessing major disasters. And I think there is going to be a collective suffering that happens. This is something all of us need to come together around. I mean, climate change can divide us which would be the worst case, or it can be somewhat of a unifier. I hope it's a unifier. 
one simple way that I think about it, it's incredibly simple. And sitting next to economists, I feel embarrassed that I'm going to use this analogy, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> uh, there's something called the social cost of carbon, and that's if you put CO2 into the atmosphere uh, per ton, how much damage does it inflict around the world? And the, you, know, you might come up with a number of like $100 of damages per ton. If you look at the Paris Agreement, we have to slash emissions, we have to cut emissions in half each decade moving forward to 2050. We're not doing it, but that's really what we have to be doing. And we need to pull 500 billion tons of CO2 out of the air. So let's take that social cost, $100 per ton, let's take 500 billion and put that together and you get $50 trillion of CO2 are in the atmosphere right now. $50 trillion of possible business innovation. That's where the food system can lead, a carbon negative food system. And, and so that's what gives me hope and optimism. I know that future can be one that drives new business, new innovation, and leaves no one behind, and puts historically disadvantaged communities, historically uh, communities that have not received the right investments in the front line of the new climate technology. I know that's all possible. And so that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. But what keeps me up at night is the fact we're not making progress fast enough. We're not seeing the kind of change we need to see. So we all need to play a role in that collective action to make sure that we bend the carbon curve and bend the warming curve and create a resilient and just society. Well, thank you for that. Would you like to add to that? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just completely. Uh, I just think we, we do have all this, all this hope. Um, I, I want us to keep putting the pieces together of the innovation and policy and, and pricing, um, and also the equity piece that you talked about. Um, so we need to keep, um, so one thing that, you know, as you brought up the social cost of carbon, there's this other sort of economic tool, cost of cost benefit analysis, which I'm sure many of you have used, which is basically like, well, this is option A, this is option B, here are all the costs, here are all the benefits, let's see how we, we compare it. Um, and often when decisions are made, um, you need to use proxy values um, to, to put in that analysis. And one of the proxy values often used is house prices and land prices, etc. cetera. Um, now, if you live in a poor community, your house is, the house price on your deed is gonna be lower than that of um, a high, you know, but it doesn't mean your way of living is worth less. So there's a lot of things that we need to fix in the way we value um, what people bring to the solution set. And so it's the same thing for farmers. We need to really think about how can we make sure that the contribution of the 4%, which is still such a mind-blowing mm. low number that you know we can feed the world on that percentage, um, is that they, they really um, become part of that solution and see value in it. So like I really keep talking about incentives to farmers. It is so important that people who are um, working with very low margins don't feel they have to um, carry another burden that environmentalists put on them. Um, we want to be part of the community that helps figure out the sort of technical solutions and then the economic pathways to make those solutions affordable um, so that it can benefit all the society. Thank you. You know, you touched on artificial intelligence a little bit ago, and uh, I was just curious about what are you seeing regarding AI in the industry? How's it being utilized? And what's good about it? And what's maybe not so good about it? Um, so there's, it's being used in every part of the agricultural industry already. One of the pieces that we are particularly interested in is the um, predictability of weather events, mm -hmm. um, and also long term, because um, we need to see what is going to hit where so that people can start adapting in a better way. One of the things that we worry about is, is a term called sort of maladaptation, which is where farmers are faced with a different climate and the reaction is to pump more water, put on more fertilizers, put on more pesticides in this kind of almost unwinnable battle against natural forces. And so one of the things we really need more data on is, you know, what is likely to happen in which location at which point so that we can start making that, again, that policy and that economic case for a adaptation pathway where farmers can maybe start using a crop that is not going to be um, so 
susceptible to a specific um, pest or maybe doesn't need as much water, et cetera. So I think that's going to be really, really important is figuring out what is the transformation pathway that we need in which location. It's going to be very location specific. Like you're saying, here in upstate, you, you're enjoying the couple of extra temperature degrees. And so there are going to be winners and losers, which is something I worry about a lot. There are going to be some areas where you're going to have bigger yields, um, better farming circumstances, and there's going to be a lot of areas which are in the form of corn, green corn belts, you know, um, which are going to suffer. And it can be within one state, there will be winners and losers. So we really need to start looking at those, those nuances and how, how we can help those, how you know political economic system can help that. And I think AI can help us there a lot. Um, I know you've been thinking about this too, so I'll throw it to you. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, our, our, I think our scientists at Cornell are using AI just across the board now. Um, I, I do think the food and ag space is one area where AI is going to impart uh, positive disruption that's going to be net beneficial. I think there's other areas of AI applications that we need to be very concerned about. Um, those are kind of outside of the food and ag space, generally speaking. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my own work. So we've been working on how to understand how much carbon is absorbed into the soil in farming practices and then how that can be turned into a commodity so that farmers have new sources of revenue. But in order for the market to appreciate that, the market needs to be able to verify. And unlike uh, some of these direct air capture approaches, which are very expensive, you can actually see the carbon. It turns into a block of calcium carbonate or something, or you can strip it off and put the CO2 into uh, oil recovery, or there's all these approaches, and not talking about the merits of these approaches. Soil, as we know, you can't see the carbon that's going down there. It's very difficult, but you can measure it over time. Uh, so we've worked on a new approach where we've driven an AI model with machine learning. So you take data, you incorporate it into the model. The model gets better and better as it's trained on the data. And then it draws predictions about how much carbon is being absorbed by the plants and then ending up in the soil. And we have found radical improvement wow. in our ability to make those kinds of predictions. And we're still driving that forward. But that's an area where I see AI coming in, is the, the, the areas that we can't really see well uh, and they're difficult to measure, AI can start to see. It can be like a seeing eye dog. <laughs> into that into that underground environment for us. Um, and then also breeding technologies, identifying the right plant traits that are climate resistant that help uh, farmers manage extreme weather. Well, that's another area where AI is going to have a hugely positive uh, benefit, I think, for, for food production. Yeah, that's very exciting and very, very interesting. So, you know, let's get back to the farmers, like the people on the ground. And you talked about uh, disadvantaged communities and people being left behind. And how do we get everybody on board? What are some of the strategies that we can use? So you see upstate's climate seven degrees warmer, for example. But what actual impact does that have on the crops? And, you know, how, can, can that be a motivator for growers and farmers to be able to really embrace this climate energy technology ecosystem that's out there but how do we how do we get over that hump so you know i grew up in a farm as i said and uh, farmers have to be shown uh, sometimes because you know they're used to um, you know being at the mercy of it's too wet it's too dry it's too hot it's too cold it's too windy whatever it is but how do we convince them and really work with them hand in hand to bring them along. And Brett, I think you've done some work on that. Yeah, so I think, I mean, some of it relates back to what I was just talking about with the AI piece, which is really trying to give farmers more confidence in what's around the corner. And also sort of talking to them about how it is different than just, oh, it's just weather change, right? And, right. and um, we spoke to a lot of farmers who really have seen it within, I mean, a lot of them are multi-generational farmers and they might still be farming with their dad and their dad might be able to say, oh, well, yeah, 30 years ago, we didn't see this and this. And so 
they are starting to see that change. Um, and so I think it's important to then work together with them on these sort of adaption, adaptation pathways. But also, um, you know, show them if there are technologies available um, and then sh basically show them the financial pathways, right? This is, you know, again, I keep coming back to that same piece. You know, it has to be regulatory possible. Um, so FDA approved, for instance, <laughs> um, it has to be financially attainable for right. them. Um, and so a lot of it is also, so right now USDA has a commodity partnership program that they put a lot of money in on um, climate kind of pilots, you can call them. And a lot of those are, they are farm groups and private companies and researchers all working together on finding these pilots, lighthouses, whatever you want to call them for transformation. Um, in specific subsectors of the ag sector in specific locations and really sort of trying things out together. Mm -hmm. So rather than, oh, we just do this in, in, a, in a lab first and then we talk to farmers and then we talk to policy, I think one of the things we're finding is we're running out of time. So we kind of need to co-develop mm -hmm. from the get-go. And I think that is a really interesting way to start working and bring farmers and their representatives along from the beginning. I think that's great. And the fact that you're focusing on the financial piece is key because uh, after the pandemic, we worked with Grow New York to do a deep dive study into what cracks appeared in the supply chain, the whole food system. And one of the things that farmers and growers talked about was the adoption of technology and how expensive it can be. So I think that's great. Yeah. Um, what do you think about this, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, well, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell has a deep commitment to the state of New York. And the way that we found is best to work with our growers and producers and communities is to first ask them questions that affect their daily life and, and listen really closely to what issues they're facing uh, what challenges they're seeing. And then we come back as a university body uh, through Cornell Cooperative Extension, through Agritech, through the faculty, and we, we, we start to shape our programs based upon that opportunity to learn from the folks who are most affected by what's happening. And I think that's the most critical piece. Now, with Upstate 2.0, going back to our uh, Circular Bioeconomy grant, the interesting thing there is that the National Science Foundation has traditionally been only focused on what's called basic research. And what that means is uh, research that is really about peering into the future of science rather than having to justify it as, OK, we want to solve this specific problem with a practical outcome today. The engine program has doubled the NSF budget to the other side, which is we need to translate we need to think about workforce. We need to think about equity and justice. And we need to think about that future in a very practical, pragmatic uh, approach that works with corporations, that works with startups, that works with uh, the entire ecosystem. And it's really exciting because we've gone on this listening tour and we've had many members of the team. What, you know, We've gone up to the St. Regis Mohawk Valley tribe to understand how their uh, agricultural operations are trying to uh, create circular systems. And so we're thinking about how do we work with them on uh, tribal enterprise like food waste and turn that into some sort of product, whether it's in the soil or it's something else. Uh, we're doing similar things right here in Tompkins County, meeting with some local producers from the Black Farmer Fund to ask them questions about what they're trying to accomplish in food sovereignty, in the culture of the food, and controlled environment ag. And I think that approach is the one we need to keep focusing on, that there's this incredible bedrock foundation to New York State agriculture, and we are going to be here, and we're committed to it, and we're going to drive it forward in sustainable innovation. And then we need equity and, and disruptive innovation. And that's, that's the key to any successful enterprise. So that's kind of the way we're trying to think through how to work with uh, the folks out there, but it really starts with listening, listening intently and understanding the challenges that our growers and producers and communities are facing today um, so that we don't get too far out into the future, even though I love thinking about the future. <laughs> That's great. Now, we have a whole room of innovators here. We have a whole audience online of innovators. And so we often talk about thinking globally, acting locally. 
but what advice would you give these innovators? They're people with ideas, raw talent, all kinds of drive and ambition, but what would you tell them about this topic and how they can actually make a difference? Do you want to start, Brett? Um, so yes, yeah, so I would think through this, this, this pathway of what is the problem you're trying to solve? Um, who is your, who's going to be using your product? What are their kind of um, limitations in how they could use it? This is the, kind of the listening tool. Um, what are your regulatory pathways of bringing your product to the market? Have you looked at that? Have you really figured out, oh, well, is it going to take 10 years through a process? What does that look like in this market? What does it look like in another market? Um, so really do your homework in terms of not just like this technology that you might be really excited about, but like how would people use it and how would be they be able to afford to use it? How would they legally use it? Like one of the things that we think about is like, oh, if you give a product to an animal, again, mm. to reduce methane, can you then still sell that milk or that beef outside to, for instance, South Korea, who might have completely different requirements? So you really need to kind of, and you probably just need to expand your network of people you talk to because not everybody's going to know all these pieces. But really start leaning into that, and it'll make your business case that much stronger because you've looked ahead to all the potential bottlenecks um, and, and partner with people, I would say. Um, on all those kind of aspects. Truly really great advice. How about you, Ben? Uh, well, my first piece of advice is talk to Britt more <laughs> uh, because I think she has the best <laughs> advice possible. I, you know, I, be visionary, be bold. Don't be afraid to, um, to really uh, peer into that future with optimism and hope, understanding the challenges in front of us. Uh, think, think very broadly about those. Develop a great business plan. I think that's critical. And, but have that be an adaptive piece of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I launched a business a couple of years ago and I learned so much in that process about how I think as a scientist versus how I need to think as an innovator. And those two can work together, but they can be a little different too. Um, so, but uh, you know, think of Cornell as a place to partner. You know, we're here to support you. We're here to support the state. Uh, we, we are very excited about Grow New York and uh, all the innovations that are happening in food and agriculture. We believe New York State is one of the few places in the world where we can really work together and think of climate smart approaches that drive innovation, that drive economic value. And uh, yeah, have fun, right? Like if it's not fun, then, then you might wanna think of something else. Not that every day you wake up and you're like, wow, I just can't wait for this day. Um, as a dean, I do think that way. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I say, you know, you might go to bed a little frustrated, but wake up happy. You know, how much time do we have on this beautiful planet? You know, think outside the box and be creative. Thank you. Such great advice, uh, such thought-provoking material. So I sincerely thank both of you for kicking off the Grow New York year number five. Just a fabulous way to start. We are going to take a few minutes to get the stage set up for our next panel discussion. And we'll get started with our digital ag panel in just a few minutes. So if you want to go uh, take a break, go get some coffee, there might still be some food out there, please feel free to do so, but come right back, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.